the founding dean of the Pepperdine University School of Public Policy, Dr. James R. Wilburn. Thank you, thank you. Please, please be seated. Thank you very much. That's probably as good as it's going to get, and I probably ought to sit down here. <laughs> thank you very much. Let me express, with, along with, our pres with President Benton's expressions, my deepest gratitude for all of you who are here tonight. I told Pat Boone a while ago, I started out with a with about twice as much to say here, and I, and I realized that the only way I could cut down my speech was to uh, cut out a lot of names. And so for every one of you here, as I look around and see all of your faces, and uh, I realize that every single one of you has played a significant role in bringing us to this place tonight. And if you're not called by name, I hope you'll know how deeply, how very deeply, I am grateful for your help, your encouragement, and frankly, for the opportunity to lead a school that I think has a great future and to have been here at its birthing and to have had a part in it. I also need to tell you that when David Davenport asked me to do this, I turned him down originally. I'd been dean of the business school for 12 years. I didn't want to be dean of anything ever again. <laughs> and uh, he finally said, well, would you do it for one or two years to get it up and running? And so I agreed after I went on the Amazon River to think about it, and I met someone on the Amazon River, and when I came back, I said, I will do this for a couple of years, and sometime in that two-year period, I gave the lady that I met on the Amazon River a ring. She worked for Jack Kemp at the time, and um, I'm, I, let me just say, <laughs> let me just say that I, um, you know, I'm, I may not be the brightest guy in the world, but I know there are a bunch of tables here that are here really to honor Gail and not me. So I want to ex express appreciation for someone who is really responsible for my staying, David, beyond the two years to ten years because she's been a full partner in this, and I would not have wanted to do it without her. Gail, would you stand? You weren't supposed to give her a better applause than me. <laughs> well, how do you summarize 10 years in 10 minutes? We could celebrate the vision of President David Davenport or the priceless counsel of people like James Q. Wilson, or there were the early believers, many of whom are here tonight, who before anybody really knew what it was going to look like, caught the vision and generously committed resources for scholarships, endowments of the Davenport Institute and professorships, and for the beautiful Henry and Virginia Braun Public Policy Center. There was the outstanding group of inaugural professors, and I could call their names and spend all night telling you about their awards, about all the wonderful things they have done. But let me just conclude my comments about the faculty by saying that if I were starting all over again, I would want to have the very same people that we have tonight on our faculty, knowing what I know now. <clears throat> Mentoring, receiving awards, receiving quarter of a million dollar research grants for their research on drug rehabilitation, but more than anything for their ability to ignite the fires of inquiry in their students? Or what about a staff that has simply been unparalleled, and again I could name names, but beginning with those who dedicated countless hours to the launching of the school, many who remain in their positions today, we've had very little turnover in these 10 years, recruiting top students, managing communications, career services, and by the way, you should know tonight that 100% of our faculty and staff 
from the professors and the assistant deans to our part-time student help have made a generous gift tonight to the scholarship program that this evening has made possible. I'm so proud of them. So how do we remember these 10 years? There have been the annual conferences on faith and public policy, the visiting speakers, people like Mikhail Gorbachev, Jack Kemp, Steve Forbes, to name a few, the impressive list of visiting professors, several of whom are here tonight. But finally, I decided there is no better way to measure the success of these 10 years than to focus on a handful of our graduates who are representative of the hundreds of students we have turned loose in the world who literally on every continent are changing the face of the earth. And I could have picked out any four or five out of several hundred. For instance, there's Aaron Witcher, a graduate of our very first class who worked in both presidential campaigns of George W. Bush and then became a press secretary sequentially for two different members of the United States Senate. She then became an assistant, a special assistant to the Secretary of Labor, Elaine Chow, before being tapped by Chris Matthews to be a producer of his program Hardball on MSNBC. If you notice for a while some more moderate conservative guests on the program, Aaron Witcher was there. <laughs> The first recipient of the school's Outstanding Alumna Award, Aaron today is Director of Television at the White House. Working with the President's Press Secretary, she is the point of contact, Adam Housley. Adam is here tonight from Fox News. She's the point of contact for all television appearances from the White House officials, all the members of the President's Cabinet. Think of it, to be a gatekeeper, gatekeeper of the, to be a gatekeeper of the White House images that appear around the world, for most people, images are reality. To be a gatekeeper of those images is a position of tremendous responsibility and influence. Aaron Witcher is an agent of, agent of change. Or Hannah Scandera. Hannah, after serving a summer internship at the Hoover Institution at Stanford, was appointed after graduation as a research fellow at Stanford. I think, David, I may be wrong, but I think we are the only public policy school that has had internships, thanks to David Davenport's connection there, at Hoover. So after her graduation, Hannah became a research fellow at Hoover, and because of her cutting-edge research on K-12 through education reform, for which she became very well known, she was invited to be Under Secretary of Education for, for the state of California, and then was tapped by our featured speaker tonight, Governor Jeb Bush from Florida, to be Deputy Commissioner of Education for the state of Florida for accountability. Some of the earliest memories that I have of Hannah are of Hannah sitting in Gail Wilburn's living room, talking about Gail's experience at the White House and talking about Hannah's future and the choices that she had as a young woman with tremendous potential. Most recently, Hannah has accepted her current position in Washington as the senior policy advisor of the U.S. Department of Education. A large number of our graduates are recruited by intelligence agencies who have discovered that we turn out people they can trust. John Machado, for instance, one of the most recent, who, who most recently was an intelligence analyst at the Department of State with expertise in Russia, the Middle East, having been selected, as several students of ours have been, for the prestigious and coveted Presidential Management Fellows Program in Washington. John subsequently joined the State Department, focusing on the former Soviet Union, and his role was to provide to the Secretary of State every morning a briefing, a country analysis, of some of the former stands, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and the other stands of the former Soviet Union, of what was going on in that region, and requiring him to have a vast understanding of economics, religion, broad knowledge of cultural history. But if you'll permit me a personal memory of John, when John was a student with us, he was carrying his little daughter 
shopping one day and she fell from her carrier and cracked her skull and was rushed to the emergency room, stayed in, in intensive care for several days. And I remember several of our faculty members, some who are here tonight, spending time beside her bed for several days in prayer. And then our staff and some of our students provided meals for the family. In fact, they froze enough meals and put them in the Machado freezer to last for a week. John's daughter recuperated, recovered, and she's doing fine. But today when John remembers his time at Pepperdine, he's very articulate about uh, the founding fathers and Tocqueville and economic liberty, the role of the United States in a post-Cold War world. But he's also equally articulate about his Pepperdine family who were there in difficult time of need. Those family beside the bed of his daughter praying and that staff member who was involved in preparing food for the week, those two are the story of this past 10 years. At Pepperdine, public policy reaches far beyond Washington Beltway, however, to state and local government, to business associations, labor unions, nonprofit organizations, public-private partnerships, to churches, synagogues, and mosques, to the family itself. And an example of this kind of partnership, I think, is Damien Trasada. Like all of our students, Damien completed a summer internship with the mayor of Philadelphia as a liaison to the inner city. And when he graduated, he returned to his hometown of Philadelphia to become vice president of corporate strategy for a mid-sized firm. But he also founded his own 501c3 nonprofit organization called Uplift Institute to work with urban youth with career counseling and job placement and mentoring. He began with 10 gang members off the streets of Philadelphia. And the cohort of young people involved in the effort this year numbers 500. Damien is truly a model of the kind of public-private partnerships in which scores of our graduates are involved and that we encourage at Pepperdine. And so from the streets of the inner city to the offices of the mayor and the governor, from the White House to dozens of embassies, we have students literally in embassies from Belfast to Baghdad, from the United Nations International Criminal Tribunal to the Hoover Institution, where one of our students was recently named as assistant director, and a dozen graduates who are now completing their PhD programs to become professors themselves to populate the classrooms of other business school, of other schools of public policy. These young leaders have gone forth, steeped in the roots of liberty and the wisdom of the great books, to use the technical tools they've mastered to pull the levers of leadership to be agents of change. And at this time, if we can bring the lights up, I'd like to ask that everybody in our audience who is either a graduate of the School of Public Policy or a current student, please stand to be recognized. Ladies and gentlemen, these are your students. It's now my pleasure to present the Honorable Jack Kemp, who will introduce our featured speaker this evening. Now, let me make just a couple of comments. Jack has been a member of our executive committee of the School of Public Policy since we began. And most of you here know maybe the broad outlines of his career. You may not know he grew up here on Fairfax Boulevard, went to Fairfax High School, where his dad had a small business. You know the rest of his history, quarterbacking two Buffalo Bills teams to all to conference championships for two decades, a member of the United States Congress, former Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, his party's nominee to be Vice President of the United States. He's a successful business leader, and with the expansive heart of his spiritual hero, Abraham Lincoln, urges his party and his nation to be expansive as well. 
When Ronald Reagan adopted the principles of Jack Kemp's Kemp-Roth bill as the foundation principle for the Reagan reform years, Jack Kemp and Ronald Reagan and others there that worked with them unleashed on this nation and it spread to the rest of the world a tidal wave of capital fueling growth and opportunity for all classes of citizens. So several years ago, we began a conversation with Jack about the possibility of his placing his papers in our archives at Pepperdine, not just to give honor to his career, but in digital form for students and leaders everywhere to, to capture one of the most important periods in our nation's history. In more recent conversations, we, with Jack and his wife Joanne, some of his colleagues and his family, we quite frankly have moved beyond what we had originally intended to include plans not only for his papers, but for an endowed chair, which would be the Jack F. Kemp Distinguished Visiting Professor, and an annual lecture symposium to recapture the classical study of political economy. And he has fans on our faculty already. Tonight, you've seen our graduates in celebration of the past 10 years. And frankly, I can't think of any better way to paint an even more commanding vision for the future in the next 10 years than to announce tonight our plans to establish the Jack F. Kemp Institute for Political Economy here in the School of Public Policy. Jack's decision to dem uh, just to, 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 to dem Jack's decision is a demonstration, not only I think of his belief in Pepperdine, but his willingness to let us use his legacy, frankly, beyond Jack, to influence and enlighten future leaders through the decades to come. Jack's nephew, John Kemp, that you've already met, who is our assistant dean, Jack, John and I have discovered as we have met recently with some of Jack's closest friends to enlist their support in this project, a common theme of Jack's inclusive and expansionist approach. Identifying with a small business entrepreneur, sometimes the inner city capitalist, sometimes an immigrant, the true engine of our economy, the sort of leader I believe that George Pepperdine was. Jack has received commitments from already from leaders like former Secretary of State Jim Baker, Nobel laureate economist Robert Mundell from Columbia University, former Secretary of State Colin Powell, to serve both as advisors and featured speakers in the Kemp Institute. And to demonstrate that we are serious about these plans, Jack has given me permission to announce to you this evening that he and Joanne have committed a gift to Pepperdine University of $1 million of their own personal resources. Let me say that for someone who has spent their lifetime in public service, it is not an unimpressive commitment to give a million dollars to Pepperdine. And we believe that there are many others of Jack's friends and associates and colleagues who will step forward to match this several times over to endow permanently the Kemp Institute. As rewarding as these past 10 years have been, we believe that the future is even more promising Thank you, Jack, and thanks to Joanne for believing in us in our promise to be faithful to our calling. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Jack F. Kemp. Thank you.